Hi guys, today we'll talk about anemia and the different drugs that we use to treat anemia. Anemia is defined as low plasma hemoglobin. Um, low hemoglobin can result from decreased red blood cells. Um, this is probably most common is low red blood cells. Um, <clears throat> people frequently think that anemia is um, low iron because that's commonly how we treat it is by giving patients iron. When you don't have enough iron, you can't make enough red blood cells. Um, so low iron is a common cause of anemia, but the definition of anemia is not low iron. Um, anemia is low plasma hemoglobin, again, commonly because of decreased red blood cells um, or low total hemoglobin um, per you know, unit or volume of blood. So low red blood cells or low total hemoglobin is anemia. Symptoms of anemia include fatigue. This is probably the most common symptom that we see with patients. They come in saying that they're just tired. Um, palpitations, shortness of breath, um, pallor or like paleness. The blood is what gives color, um, especially in light skinned people. So we can see paleness. Um, dizziness is another kind of common one and insomnia. There are a lot of different causes of anemia, um, and it's important to know the causes because we treat different types of anemia different ways. Um, there are multiple different physiologic issues that can cause anemia. Chronic blood loss can result in, um, in anemia. Uh, obviously, if you're losing blood constantly, your marrow can't keep up with making new blood, so the result is that you have low red blood cells. Um, bone marrow abnormalities, the red blood cells come from the bone marrow. So some bone marrow abnormalities can lead to a decrease in the production of red blood cells, so anemia. Uh, hemolysis, hemolysis is a breakdown of red blood cells. So if there's excess hemolysis, we can have anemia, hence hemolytic anemia. Um, infection, malignancy, endocrine deficiencies, renal failure, as well as sickle cell. There are some different drugs that can lead to anemia. Um, examples include NSAIDs, um, some antibiotics, um, anti-cancer drugs, um, our big ones, anti-cancer drugs lead to um, a lot of anemia, uh, <clears throat> et cetera. There are various different drugs that can lead to anemia. Um, and then finally, nutritional deficiencies. Um, this is a really common one uh, and one that you know, conveniently um, is very easy to treat as well. So some nutritional deficiencies that can lead to anemia include deficiencies in iron, uh, folic acid and B12. Um, that looks like an R, sorry, that's a 12. That's vitamin B12. Um, vitamin B12 is also called cyanocobalamin. Like when we give it, when we give injectable vitamin B12 uh, prescriptions to patients, that is actually cyanocobalamin. That's what, that's what we write it for, cyanocobalamin. Um, but all of these, iron, folic acid, B12, um, are needed for red blood cell production. So if we're deficient in any of these, we can't make enough red blood cells. So that can result in um, red blood cell deficiency anemia. Treatment of anemia depends on the cause. Um, <clears throat> frequently, the first thing that we will do is give nutritional supplementation. Since that's a really common cause of anemia and it's a really easy thing to do, we can just give patients nutritional supplementation and see if that fixes the issue. Um, transfusion of whole blood in acute situations. Um, for example, if we have you know, um, a lot of blood loss, like acute blood loss, obviously we're gonna have to transfuse blood or if the anemia has progressed so far that um, the situation is, you know, needs immediate, um, immediate fixing, then we can tr transfuse whole blood, but that's not the typical, uh, the typical treatment. Um, hydroxyurea, this is 
very specific. Um, hydroxyurea is a drug that we give for sickle cell anemia. You've probably heard uh, <clears throat> heard about hydroxyurea in the, the recent past. There was a lot of talk about hydroxyurea being used for COVID in the beginning of the COVID crisis. It didn't turn out to be something that was beneficial for patients, um, especially because you have to be very experienced in prescribing hydroxyurea or else it's very dangerous. So it's not something that your average PCP should be prescribing. Um, because of the adverse drug effects that, again, can be dangerous. So, you know, this didn't end up being something that everybody was prescribing for COVID. Um, however, it was in the news a lot in the beginning because we thought it might be something that was widely used. So, um, anyhow, hydroxyurea, though, is used for sickle cell anemia. We'll start by talking about iron. Um, iron deficiency is the most common nutritional deficiency. We do not get enough iron in our diets, um, especially with the, the recent shift where a lot of patients, um, a lot of people are going vegetarian and vegan. And when, um, when somebody goes on you know, or chooses to go that, that lifestyle, it's incredibly important to supplement the vitamins and minerals that are not being taken in with a diet. And iron is something that um, patients are often deficient in. You can get plenty of iron from you know, other sources besides meat, but most people don't eat enough of those other sources like spinach, for example. Um, so it's really important that patients supplement if they're not getting enough in their diet, which frequently does not happen. So iron deficiency is very, very common. Hence, that's a very common cause of anemia. Iron deficiency occurs when there's a negative balance, um, meaning we are using more iron than we're taking in in the diet. So this negative balance or deficiency can occur when we deplete our iron stores or when we don't have enough intake. Inadequate intake is pretty self-explanatory. You're just not eating enough iron. Um, a depletion of iron stores can happen for a lot of different reasons. Um, depletion can result from chronic or acute bleeding. Um, chronic bleeding we see sometimes with like ulcers. Um, we see you know, multiple different types of GI bleeds, upper GI bleeds and lower GI bleeds, but that can result in, uh, in iron deficiency. Um, different types of acute bleeding, this can be traumatic. Um, we also see with um, things like menstruation. So when females, you know, once a month are losing quite a bit of blood, that can result in some iron deficiency. Um, pregnancy can result commonly in iron deficiency, which is why it's so important to supplement iron um, in prenatal vitamins. And then also sometimes in kids when they're going through accelerated growth phases, they do need um, increased iron during those, those growth spurts. Um, iron deficiency anemia is associated with, besides the actual anemia, um, there are some other kind of things that we see that go along with it. Um, it can be associated with pica. Pica is, um, is the hunger for kind of odd things. When people get cravings and, and want to eat things that are not normal food sources. So stuff like dirt, um, ice, paper, um, Again, it's just like a hunger for odd things. The reason that people get, or that patients get cravings for these things are that they could possibly be sources of the mineral that you're deficient in. The body is really smart. Um, so if you're deficient in a certain vitamin or mineral, you can actually crave things that have that in it. Um, now, it doesn't, like ice, for example, doesn't have iron in it. So this isn't foolproof, um, but it is, uh, it is something that occurs. Um, also, we see um, an upward curvature of the nails. This was upward curvature of fingernails and toenails. Uh, 
Um, and then finally, uh, and this is something that we we really commonly see uh, in kids in kids as well, but we commonly see soreness and cracking at the corners of the mouth. Um, so it oh, it's almost like you would expect with like really severe chap lips, but but specifically we see it here at the corners of the mouth, like little slit like cracking right at the corners. Um, um, <clears throat> the way we treat uh, anemia caused by iron deficiency is by giving iron, right? Relatively self-explanatory. If they don't have enough iron to make red blood cells, we give them more iron. Um, elemental iron it is given to correct the deficiency. We give 150 to 180 milligrams of elemental iron per day. Um, typically, we give this in two or three divided doses. There are slow release formulations. There are slow release formulations that allow for once daily dosing. However, they do tend to be a little bit more expensive. Um, iron can be bought over the counter. There are some prescription versions of iron as well, but iron can be purchased over the counter for a relatively cheap uh, Patients don't have to spend too much money on it. However, the, the cheapest versions are the versions that patients have to take numerous times a day. The slow release or extended release versions do tend to be a little bit more expensive, but they are much more convenient. Again, iron is available um, in multiple different formulations. We just talked about oral formulations that can be immediate release or extended release. There are also parenteral formulations of iron. Now, oral formulations, it might take several weeks before the full efficacy is seen. So don't expect that the patient's gonna take a pill and then you know the next day it's gonna be corrected. It takes some time. Remember, the patients have to actually produce red blood cells. Um, and we replenish all of our iron stores and then we start to make new red blood cells. And, and it can take a few weeks before the anemia is completely um, reversed. The parenteral formulations do work more rapidly So there's a more rapid correction of the anemia with parenteral formulations. So if you have a patient um, who is experiencing more severe symptoms, that parenteral formulation will get them corrected faster. Also, parenteral is used in patients who can't tolerate oral iron um, or in patients who can't absorb oral iron. Um, <clears throat> So in that case, we would use parental formulations as well. Um, also, we use parenteral iron in patients who are getting EPO, um, epopoietin, with um, hemodialysis or chemo. So parenteral has more rapid correction. Um, it can be used in patients who can't tolerate or absorb oral iron. Um, and we give parenteral in patients getting um, EPO or epipoietin with hemodialysis or chemotherapy. Um, EPO is just a synthetic version or it's, it's just the drug form of epipoietin. Um, or erythropoietin, sorry, um, erythropoietin. Erythropoietin, T, T, I, N. Um, erythropoietin, remember, is the hormone that is released from our kidneys. Um, and that is that goes to the bone marrow and it stimulates the production of red blood cells. So we can give EPO, which is just our drug version of erythropoietin, to stimulate red blood cell formation. So when we're giving EPO to, form, to stimulate red blood cell formation, we also give parenteral iron because um, that iron is gonna be needed for uh, the red blood cell formation.
the relative amount of iron that gets absorbed decreases as the dose increases. So notice here, I'm saying the relative amount, not total amount. So as you give a higher dose of iron, um, the percentage of that dose that we can absorb gets lower and lower and lower. So there are maximum amounts of iron that we can absorb um, at a time. Um, so you don't absorb all of the iron that you're giving. And if you give a huge dose of iron, you're not going to absorb um, nearly, nearly all of it. A lot of that iron is not going to get absorbed. This is why we typically dose that iron two or three times a day, um, unless it's slow release so that we can just slowly absorb it. Otherwise, if you give just a huge dose of iron in the morning, and it's just normal iron you give it in the morning, um, most of that iron is just going to stay in the GI tract and leave the body in the feces. So it's just going to be wasted. Um, so splitting it into multiple doses a day is the best way to ensure that the patient's going to actually absorb enough of it to be effective. Um, something else that's important to keep in mind is different formulations of iron have different percentages of elemental iron. So iron comes in a bunch of different salt forms, right? Like iron is the, uh, it's a salt. Iron is positively charged, it's a cation, and we combine it with some sort of a negatively charged anion, and that's how it's given. So depending on what anion we pair with it, there might be a different total weight. We're not worried about the total weight because we don't care about that anion. All we care about is the iron. Um, so remember, we want 150 to 180 milligrams of elemental iron. Um, that means that we might have different doses of total, you know, drug that we're giving based on, you know, the relative percent of iron. I hope that makes sense. So different iron formulations, ferrous gluconate, um, ferric ammonium citrate, um, ferrous sulfate is a really common one that's given. Um, again, ferrous sulfate, um, carbonyl iron, polysaccharide iron complex. So slow FE, um, ferrotabs, these are really common, iron citrate. Um, and then if you look over here, this is the percentage of elemental iron. So notice that some of these aren't here, like carbonyl iron, for example, is 100% um, iron, but the ones up here are less and less and less percentage of iron. Um, if you look over here at the notes, um, you'll see like ferrous gluconate has the least amount of elemental iron, but similar tolerability to ferrous sulfate. Um, <clears throat> Most ferrous sulfate, if you look over here, most common oral iron supplement. So I was saying ferrous sulfate is really common. Um, it's got the lowest cost. It's got good effectiveness, good tolerability. So uh, again, ferrous sulfate is typically what we see given. When we look at the adverse drug effects of iron, GI issues are the most common adverse drug effects. Okay, so GI issues um, <clears throat> when we're talking about the oral formulations. And that's really just because of local irritation. The iron is irritating to the GI tract. Um, so GI stuff that we see include abdominal pain, um, constipation is a big one, um, nausea, diarrhea, dark stools, um, the, the diarrhea can be because of irritation, but we see constipation much, much more frequently. Um, again, we do see dark stools a lot too, which sometimes freaks patients out. But if you just tell them to expect this, then they know and they won't be worried. Um, parenteral formulations can cause fatal hypersensitivity and anaphylactoid reactions. Um, <clears throat> This is most common with iron dextran formulation. So if you're going to give patients iron dextran, you have to give a test dose first. So you have to give the test dose first to make sure that they can tolerate the drug. Um, caution in patients who have active infections so 
Iron is essential for bacterial growth. Um, so if you have a patient who has a bacterial infection and you infuse a large amount of iron, you're fueling, like you're literally just giving fuel to that bacteria um, and then you can fuel the infection. So you don't want to infuse large amounts of iron if an infection is present, because again, you can stimulate that infection. Folic acid um, is given when we have a deficiency in folate in the body. Um, the natural form in our body is called folate. Uh, this is vitamin B9. Uh, folic acid is the, the drug formulation that we give. Um, folic acid is given, again, just in deficiency states to supplement what we don't have enough of. And this can correct um, anemia because, again, we need folic acid in order to produce red blood cells. Folic acid deficiency can occur because of increased demand. Um, increased demand happens in pregnancy. Pregnancy and also lactation. Folic acid is very important in, um, during pregnancy in order to prevent neural tube defects. So like spina bifida, for example. So we always supplement folic acid in pregnancy. Um, poor absorption of folic acid can also lead to deficiency. Um, poor absorption can happen due to small intestine pathologies. Absorption of folic acid happens in the small intestine, um, the jejunum mostly. So any small intestine pathology where we have um, issues with the jejunum can decrease the amount of folic acid that we can absorb. We also see deficiency in alcoholism, which we see a lot of deficiencies in alcoholism, but folic acid deficiency is one of those. Um, also in patients who have had bariatric surgery, There are a lot of drugs um, that can also cause um, folic acid deficiencies. Um, dihydrofolate reductase inhibitors, um, those are drugs like methotrexate, which is an anti-cancer drug, um, trimethoprim, trimethoprim is an antibiotic, um, there are drugs, um, anti-seizure drugs like phenytoin, phenytoin and um, phenobarbital that can actually decrease the absorption of folic acid. Um, there are some antiviral drugs like azathioprine and zidovudine. Um, zidovudine um, and azathioprine. I can't fit it on here, but azathioprine, those can also, uh, they're DNA inhibitors, they can also decrease the amount of folic acid um, that we have to use to, or that we have to make uh, red blood cells. So any of these issues, I know there's a lot of them, can lead to deficiency in folic acid, so uh, anemia. Folic acid deficiency results in megaloblastic anemia. Um, this term megaloblastic, this is just referring to the, the, like the morphology of the red blood cells. So like what you're actually seeing in the red blood cells. And actually megaloblastic is referring to one of the precursor cells. So these are changes that we would see in the red blood cell um, precursor cells. Megaloblastic anemia is it's a specific type of macrocytic anemia. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the like specific definitions and morphologies of anemia, but just FYI, folic acid deficiency refer, um, results in megaloblastic anemia. The reason that this is important um, is because vitamin B12 deficiency also results in megaloblastic anemia. So when we test, if we see uh, megaloblastic anemia, that could tell us that there is either folic acid deficiency 
or vitamin B12 deficiency, or both. Um, now, when we give somebody folic acid, when we supplement folic acid, that can correct some of that megaloblastic anemia, um, even if there was also vitamin B12 deficiency. Uh, so we don't give only folic acid because we don't want to mask the symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency. So if we're going to supplement, full, if we see megaloblastic anemia, um, we're going to supplement both folic acid and vitamin B12. Okay, the reason we don't just get folic acid is because vitamin B12 deficiency um, can lead to, can progress and lead to other more severe issues, um, like neural issues. So we don't want to just give folic acid and allow that B12 deficiency to be causing other problems in the background. Um, if we see megaloblastic anemia, we give folic acid and vitamin B12. Uh, folic acid is really well tolerated. Uh, it can cause some nausea, bad taste, irritability, but again, patients typically take it and don't notice a thing, um, except for the fact that the anemia gets better, uh, but they don't notice any adverse drug effects. It's really well tolerated. Um, we very or we almost always give oral formulations of folic acid. Um, there is parenteral formulations available, but typically oral works fine. Um, we give parenteral formulations if there's some sort of pathology in the small intestine, um, if they have some sort of issue in the jejunum so they can't absorb it. Um, otherwise, oral formulations work. When we give folic acid, we're not really worried about um, overdose too much, the excess just gets excreted in the urine. So it's relatively safe and easy. We dose it, what they need is used, the excess gets excreted in the urine, it's water soluble so it doesn't build up, um, and they're fine. Rarely there are hypersensitivity reactions to the parenteral form, um, but that's really rare, and typically we just use oral anyways. Cyanocobalamin, um, I mentioned earlier, is vitamin B12. Um, cyanocobalamin is used to replace cyanocobalamin deficiency, um, <clears throat> which again can cause anemia. Um, cyanocobalamin or B12 deficiency can occur due to insufficient um, intake or insufficient absorption of um, B12. Insufficient absorption is typically due to a lack of intrinsic factor. From parietal cells in the stomach. Um, remember that in the stomach, parietal cells, which are some of the cells that are in the glands of the stomach, parietal cells release intrinsic factor. And intrinsic factor then you know leaves the stomach with all the other food and everything, and it makes its way into the small intestine. And that intrinsic factor is necessary for us to be able to absorb vit vitamin B12. Um, if we don't have intrinsic factor, we can't absorb the B12. It doesn't matter if we're eating it, we can't absorb it. So um, that's typically what causes us to not be able to absorb vitamin B12 is if we don't have intrinsic factor being released. Um, pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia um, is an anemia that occurs. Uh, it's it's uh, it's an auto auto autoimmune thank you it's an autoimmune disorder um, pernicious anemia occurs when we have autoantibodies so our own immune cells that target um, intrinsic factor or parietal cells or both so in pernicious anemia our own body attacks the parietal cells and intrinsic factor so we can't absorb vitamin b12 so pernicious anemia um, would be because of impaired absorption of B12. And for that, we would have to give injectable vitamin B12 because supplementing it by mouth would not do any good. We can't absorb it. So for that case, we would always have to use injectable. Um, 
this can also be due in inadequate absorption can also occur when we have gastric resection. Um, so when part of the stomach has been surgically removed, we can decrease the amount of parietal cells that we have. So we can have insufficient intrinsic factor produced because of that as well. Um, insufficient intake of a vitamin B12 is common in strict vegans and vegetarians. Um, I mentioned this with um, I mentioned this with iron, um, but this is is really common with B12. Um, so in strict vegans, strict vegetarians who don't supplement, again, in patients who um, are going to choose to eat that way or choose to live that lifestyle, really, um, supplementing is incredibly important to make sure that you get all of the, the vitamins and minerals that you need. Um, metformin. Metformin, which you guys know is um, a very common drug used for diabetes. That's the first line drug given for type 2 diabetes. Uh, this interferes with absorption of vitamin B12. So supplementing vitamin B12 can be important um, on patients who are on metformin or may be important in patients on metformin. Vitamin B12 deficiency results in megaloblastic anemia. Um, again, same thing that we just said with folic acid deficiency, they both cause megaloblastic anemia. Problems with vitamin B12 deficiency are that um, it can progress beyond just anemia. Um, it can be associated with tingling in the hands and feet, um, difficulty walking, dementia, um, this, this can progress to, or severe cases can progress to really uh, severe neurological dysfunction. Um, this can include hallucinations, paranoia, schizophrenia symptoms. Um, it can be very, very severe. So it's not benign. I think vitamin deficiency sounds kind of like, okay, well, you supplemented and you're okay. No, this can result in very severe neurological dysfunction if it's left untreated. So um, supplementing vitamin B12 when it's deficient is incredibly important. Um, administration of folic acid alone can mask B12 deficiency because giving just folic acid can correct that megaloblastic anemia but that still means we don't have enough vitamin B12 and the B12 is needed for other things as well. So that takes away that, that, that clear sign that we have. Megaloblastic anemia is a clear sign that we might be deficient in B12. Uh, if you just get folic acid, you take that sign away. So then we don't know anymore. And all this other stuff can, neurological stuff can be happening behind the scenes. So again, never just give folic acid for megaloblastic anemia. If a patient has megaloblastic anemia, you can get folic acid and cyanocobalamin, right? Or and vitamin B12 um, to avoid this severe neurological dysfunction. So again, administer folic acid and cyanocobalamin. I've said it 15 times, so don't get that wrong on the test and don't get that wrong in your patients, okay? Give them both. It's very easy to give both of them. They're very well tolerated. There is no reason that anybody should progress to severe neurological dysfunction. Um, use of cyanocobalamin, um, if it's a dietary deficiency, so if you have a patient who is, um, you know, vegan or vegetarian, or just for whatever reason, they're not, you know, getting enough in their diet, then we can give the oral for um, vitamin B12 daily to supplement. Um, if there is malabsorption issues, so maybe they had, um, you know, some sort of gastric resection, um, or if they have pernicious anemia, which we said was an autoimmune issue. Um, in these cases, they can't absorb it. So giving it orally is going to be useless. They just, they won't absorb it. It'll just go through the GI tract. So for them, we give, um, we give parenteral formulations. We, we inject it. You can give it um, intramuscularly or deep sub-Q, um, subcutaneously. And we just give it once monthly. That's super easy. Um, if we're going to, um, sometimes I have seen it used more frequently. 
um, but once monthly is okay. Um, I am hydroxycobalamin is preferred, uh, but that's really rarely used in the US, like very rarely used. We typically use the I am cyanocobalamin, um, but technically speaking, hydroxycobalamin is preferred. Uh, one thing in patients who have malabsorption or uh, patients who are post-bariatric surgery, uh, it does say that you can give daily oral therapy, but you have to give huge doses. So it's just easier to give a, a once monthly injection. Uh, it's again, once a month, just a little, you know, one ml injection, and then you're done with it, as opposed to taking huge doses orally every day, and then still being worried about if it's actually being absorbed enough or not. Um, so either would be okay if you had a patient that just had a huge fear of needles and just refused, they just wouldn't do it, then you can give oral, just give a really high dose. Um, but in pernicious anemia, it's got to be given injectable, that's it. Uh, we mentioned um, EPO earlier. Um, Erythropoietin is a natural hormone in our body. Um, it's produced by the kidney in the, the um, JCG or the juxtaglomerular complex right by the glomerulus and the nephron. Uh, we produce erythropoietin naturally. And this is done when we have decreased oxygen delivery to the kidney, so hypoxia. Um, but decreased oxygen delivery to the kidney or decreased blood flow to the kidney as well, the kidney will release erythropoietin. And erythropoietin travels through the bloodstream to go to the bone marrow, and it stimulates red blood cell formation in the bone marrow. Um, we can mimic the action of erythropoietin. We have a couple different drugs that we can give that act like erythropoietin to stimulate red blood cell formation. Um, these are typically used in more severe um, chronic forms of anemia. Um, EPO um, or epoetin alpha. Epoetin alpha is our synthetic formulation of or our formulation of erythropoietin. It's actually the exact same molecule as human erythropoietin. It's just made with recombinant DNA technology. So we take the gene that makes erythropoietin in us and we insert that gene into, you know, some sort of bacteria and or fungus and then it makes it for us and then we can take it and give it. Um, so it's just a drug version of erythropoietin, acts the exact same. Um, darbopoietin is a really similar, um, it's just that darbopoietin is a long acting formulation. So darbopoietin is just longer acting than the um, EPO alpha. Um, both epopoietin, or sorry, epoietin um, and darbopoietin have a delayed onset. Um, because of that, they're not effective for acute treatment. Um, if you need acute treatment, just injecting EPO alpha is not going to work. Um, they are used, so again, this is why I say for chronic anemia. Um, they're used in end-stage renal disease, um, HIV, bone marrow disorders, prematurity. So in preemie babies, we can give EPO, um, as well as in some forms of malignancy. Uh, these are given injectable. They're given parenterally. There's no oral formulation, so they can be given typically subcutaneously. Um, we do give them IV in dialysis patients, though. Um, <clears throat> when we give EPO, it's very frequent that we need to also give patients iron supplementation because we're stimulating the production of a bunch of red blood cells, so they need a bunch of iron ready to go in that hemoglobin. Remember, in every hemoglobin, we have four iron. So we're going to be producing a ton of hemoglobin and a ton of red blood cells, so we need a ton of iron to make that happen. So frequently, we'll, we'll supplement iron as well. Um, 
Adverse drug effects include increased blood pressure, um, thrombosis, and CVA, um, arthralgia, um, itching, pruritus, itching in hives, um, edema, and dyspnea are all um, possible. So this is a little bit more severe, used for more severe issues, more severe types of anemia, and has some more severe adverse drug effects than we see with the other agents. All the other agents are, um, we're just supplementing normal, natural, um, you know, vitamins and minerals that we should already have in the body. Um, this is, this is a higher level treatment. So you see um, more severe adverse drug effects. Um, caution, when EPO is used to target a hemoglobin over 11, serious cardiovascular events, increased risk of death, and shortened time to tumor progression have been seen. Um, so do not overshoot the hemoglobin level with these. Um, use the minimum effective dose and do not exceed hemoglobin over 12. Um, hemoglobin level should not rise by any more than one gram per deciliter per two weeks. If hemoglobin level exceeds 10, the dose should be decreased or stopped. Okay, so in other words, use EPO, um, epoetin or darbopoietin to increase the hemoglobin. Once you start getting close to a normal level, it needs to be held back. Um, decreased and it walks back. Do not overshoot. Do not, um, don't, not, more is not better in this case because once hemoglobin starts to get too high, you start to form clots. And that's when we see the cardiovascular events, thrombosis, CVA start to occur. Um, <clears throat> we'll move on from anemia and talk a little bit about neutropenia. Uh, penia, this term penia means poverty. So neutropenia is a poverty of neutrophils. So this is when we have low neutrophils, not enough neutrophils. Um, <clears throat> in our body, we have numerous different colony stimulating factors. Either little hormones or little factors that stimulate the production of different blood cells. We have numerous different types of colony stimulating factors, um, and the difference between them is that they stimulate the production of different cells. So GCSF is granulocyte colony stimulating factor. So that stimulates the production of all three granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Um, <clears throat> neutrophils being by far the most common of our white blood cells, so that's gonna be stimulating neutrophils more than anything else. GMCSF stands for granulocyte monocyte colony stimulating factor. So that's gonna stimulate all three granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and monocytes. And so really all of the white blood cells except for lymphocytes. So we naturally have these in our body and they're released when we don't have enough white blood cells and then they go to the bone marrow and make us make more white blood cells. Well, we can also give these. Um, we can also inject them, exo like give exogenous colony stimulating factors to patients to stimulate the production of granulocytes, um, which again, the most common is neutro the neutrophils. So that's what we're gonna see the biggest change in. Um, we use these colony stimulating factors to decrease severe neutropenia. Um, decrease is a bad word. We're decreasing the neutropenia, but we're increasing neutrophils, right? Because neutropenia is when we have too low neutrophils. So we're going to give the colony stimulating factors to improve that. So you could change decrease to, to improve severe neutropenia, right, to increase neutrophils. Um, <clears throat> we use colony stimulating factors um, prophylactically with chemotherapy or bone marrow transplantation. Um, during chemotherapy, some of the cells that are affected most are the um, white blood cells, right, because they're, we're 
are killing all rapidly dividing cells. And the, the marrow, the, the white blood cells and red blood cells really are affected a lot. So we give chemo until we've depressed their immune system so much that we just can't give it anymore. And then we have to take a break, let their blood cells rebound, and then we can give chemo more. Well, we can give colony stimulating factors to help that person, um, you know, to keep their blood cells up so we don't have to stop the chemo or to help them rebound so we can give another, another round of chemo quicker. Um, so we can give them chemotherapy or also bone marrow transplantation. Um, when we transplant bone marrow, we have to kill all of their bone marrow, then we give them new bone marrow, and we need their new bone marrow to start making those white cells quickly. In that period of time when we've just given them the new bone marrow, they are at a huge risk for infection because they're they just don't have an active immune system yet. So we can give them um, you know, colony stimulating factors in order to stimulate that bone marrow to, to build a new immune system quickly. Um, you see the agents down here at the bottom, filgrastim, um, peg filgrastim, sargomastim, and tbo filgrastim. Filgrastim, um, filgrastim and sargomastim are both IV or sub-Q. Um, TBO, Philgrastim and peg philgrastim are sub Q only. Um, the main difference between the agents is just dosing. Um, there's no evidence that shows one agent is better than the others when you look at efficacy. Um, so they're all equal efficacy. Um, the major difference is just dosing. So philgrastim, uh, TBO, and um, Sargramos, um, sargramostim are all dosed daily beginning 24 to 72 hours after chemo. So again, you give chemo, the chemo is going to knock out all of their white blood cells and then we can give them filgrastim um, and that will stimulate their bone marrow to make new cells so that they can recover quickly without getting neutropenic um, and without getting any infections, they can recover quickly and then we'll be able to give them their next round of chemo. Um, <clears throat> until the absolute neutrophil count is 5,000 to 10,000 cells per microliter. Um, peg filgrastim, one dose is given 24 hours after chemo. Um, there's no monitoring of the absolute neutrophil count needed for peg filgrastim. So peg filgrastim is um, just looking at this much easier to use. You just wait 24 hours after chemo, give them one dose, bam, you're done. The other agents, um, you've got to monitor the absolute neutrophil count and you've got to dose them daily, you know, multiple doses until you get to that desired um, absolute neutrophil count. So peg filgrastim is a bit easier to use. Um, I would also assume that it's probably a bit more expensive as well, but I'm not positive of that. Um, bone pain is a common adverse drug effect. Um, and that's the case really with anything that's affecting the marrow because the marrow's in the bones. Um, so anytime you give a drug that, that stimulates um, bone marrow activity, it does frequently cause bone pain. All right, so the last thing that we'll mention is sickle cell disease. Um, sickle cell disease is treated with hydroxyurea. Um, hydroxyurea is a ribonucleotide reductase inhibitor, um, so it inhibits um, this enzyme, ribonucleotide reductase. And this, it's used to decrease the frequency of painful sickle cell crises. Um, it's not a cure-all. It does not, you know, cure sickle cell. It doesn't completely prevent um, crises, but it does decrease the number of patients who are going to have a sickle cell crisis. It does decrease the frequency of um, sickle cell crises, which again are very, very painful. Um, the way that it works is um, it increases fetal hemoglobin, um, which dilutes the, the like amount of abnormal hemoglobin S. So the more 
fetal hemoglobin you have, the less relative um, abnormal hemoglobin you have. Um, polymerization of hemoglobin S is reduced. So there's going to be a decrease in sickle cells that are there to block capillaries. Um, and that's what causes problems, right? When the sickle, when the abnormal sickle cells block capillaries, that causes anoxia to the, the, the downstream tissue in the area, and that's incredibly painful. Um, so the, the more fetal hemoglobin we have, you know, the less relative abnormal hemoglobin, the less, um, you know, crises we have. This is not an immediate response. The drug takes long term before it's effective. Um, response may take three to six months. Uh, and again, it's still not a cure all. Like if you look over here at the graph, this is showing you. So as you go, you know, zero to 12 months to 24 months. And then over here, um, the vertical axis is showing you the patients who who are showing their first painful episode. So the percentage of patients who are having a sickle cell crisis. Um, patients on placebo, that's the blue line. So on the blue line, by 12 months, 90% of patients on placebo have had a sickle cell crisis. So that's almost everyone. Almost all patients have a sickle cell crisis within 12 months. Um, if you look at the hydroxyurea group, um, at 12, that's the red line, at 12 months, 75% of patients have had an episode. So that's still not great. Um, it does, that is significant. There are about 15% of patients that it, it saved from having that sickle cell crisis. But, you know, in the, the, the graph, um, the slope is less steep. So it, it does, there are fewer and fewer patients over time. So it is putting off the experience of that, that sickle cell crisis. And if you look all the way out to two years, it's still not, you know, it's probably like 80, 85% of patients have had a crisis. So it, it does work, but it's not a miracle cure-all. Um, it, it doesn't work fantastically. It has been used off-label um, to treat things like AML, acute myeloid um, leukemia, uh, psoriasis, polycythemic varum. Um, we saw it being used in the COVID crisis for a little while, but hydroxyurea should only be used by experienced practitioners. This is not something that you should prescribe if you have never prescribed it before. Um, if you're not you know, highly educated on it, you're not ready to monitor it very closely. Um, and the reason for that is the adverse drug effects include dangerous bone marrow suppression. Um, so you don't want to be using this for a patient and then have them be, um, you know, severely neutropenic and get deathly ill on you. Um, so because of that bone marrow suppression, um, blood cell levels need to be monitored very closely and it should not be used by anybody who is not uh, educated in using it and experienced in using it can also cause some cutaneous vasculitis as well. Uh, and that's it. All right, guys, thank you very much for um, watching the lecture on anemia. If you have any questions, go ahead and shoot me an email and I'll be happy to get back to you.